Good afternoon. Commissioners, before we begin today, I would like to welcome Claudia Caballera, who will be sworn in as KUB's new commissioner here in just a few minutes. So welcome, Claudia. Uh, I'll now call this meeting to order. Uh, Mr. Coley, if you would note for the record that all commissioners are present. First item on our agenda is approval of minutes that were mailed on December 17th, or for the meeting of December 17th. I need a motion and a second. So moved. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All right, and for our first official action, uh, today, we will uh, move to the swearing in of Ms. Caballero. Uh, the mayor has appointed and the city council has confirmed uh, Claudia's appointment for a seven year term as KUB commissioner. And I know I speak for all of us when I say how pleased we are to have Claudia here to join the board. Uh, and now I'm going to recognize Bill Coley to administer the oath of office. I do solemnly swear, you solemnly swear that I possess the qualifications required by law. That I, re I possess, possess the required qualifications required by law for the office of KUB commissioner. For the office of KUB commissioner. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the State of Tennessee. The Constitution of the State of Tennessee. The Charter of the City of Knoxville. And the bylaws of KUB. That I do not have contracts or business interest with KUB. That constitute a conflict of interest. And that I will faithfully discharge. And, I will faithfully discharge and, and perform with fidelity. And perform with fidelity. The duties of commissioner. The duties of commissioner without fear or favor. To the extent of my skill and ability. To the extent of my skill and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Moving to our next item, the charter requires that the board elect officers each year following the new commissioner election. And I'm going to turn it over once again to Bill Coley to conduct the election. It's my big day. It is. Commissioners, <laughs> <laughs> last month the nominating committee nominated a slate of officers for your consideration. You will recall that the recommended slate of officers is as follows. Jerry Askew, chair. John Worden, Vice Chair, and Mark, Mark Walker, Secretary. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, is there a motion uh, and second to elect the slate selected by the nominating committee? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, a motion and a second. All those in favor of the, uh, the nominated slate, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right, the elections have been concluded and congratulations to the officers. And if I had a gavel, uh, Commissioner Askew, I would turn it over. Instead, I'll just turn the meeting over to you. Very good, thank you. And thank all of you for your confidence. Uh, the next item on our agenda is consideration for the second final reading of resolution 1428, a resolution amending section three of, of resolution number 1060 by replacing the existing rate schedule E, sales for resale of the water division. And I'll recognize uh, uh, Mr. Bolas. Thank you, Chair. Uh, commissioners, I want to recognize Mark Walker, our Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, to provide you a brief overview of this water rate change on second and final reading. Uh, commissioner, as you will recall, at last month's meeting, you did uh, approve on 
first reading, an adjustment to our wholesale water rate, um, which was really designed to make the rate more competitive uh, to the other source of supply for our recurring wholesale water customers. And really the prime objective of making this adjustment is to uh, secure water system revenue going forward, which certainly we believe is in the best interest of all our water system customers. Uh, just as a brief reminder, we have two recurring wholesale water customers, that is the town of Dandridge and Shady Grove Utility District. Um, combined, on a historical basis, they purchase about 1.6 million gallons of water per day from KUB, which translates to about 1.3 million in annual water system revenue. So it is somewhat significant. Both of these utilities, both of these customers are located in Jefferson County, Tennessee, and they purchase a portion of their water supply from Jefferson City as well, which really brings us to the crux of the situation. The rate charged by Jefferson City is currently 13% below what KUB charges for, for wholesale water. Um, so both of those customers, um, um, I guess really actually the, the town of Dandridge in response to that rate differential notified us back in, in the fall early fall that they intended to reduce their purchase levels from KUB and switch to Jefferson City because of, of the rate distinction. And they actually began doing that in the month of October. Um, that resulted, or will result in, an, if you look at it from an annualized basis, a $450,000 loss in water system revenue. Now, if Shady Grove was to follow suit, they haven't indicated that they would, but if they were to follow suit, then that would result in a reduction of about 1.2 million in water system revenue for KUB, which again is significant. It is equivalent to a 2% water rate increase if we tried to replace that through, through that means. So at the uh, audit committee's uh, October um, audit and finance committee meeting, uh, staff discussed with uh, the committee the idea of reducing uh, the rate, uh, our wholesale water rate, to make it more competitive with Jefferson City. The committee was receptive to that idea, provided that we secured written letters of commitment from both Dandridge and Shady Grove, basically stating that if the board took this action, they would return, Dandridge would return to their historic level or go higher, and Shady Grove would remain at their level or potentially go higher as well. So we did receive both those executed written letters of commitment after talking with Dandridge and Shady Grove. They, con they consulted with their boards and with those in hand, we did present a proposal recommendation to the board back in December to adjust the wholesale water rate basically to the same level of that is charged by, by Jefferson City. And I do want to mention that in response to, to that action, Dandridge has already um, actually increased their water purchases and returned to their historic levels. So that is good news. And so today we do present for your consideration on second and final reading resolution 1428 which does adjust our wholesale water rate from $1.70 per 100 cubic feet of water to $1.48 per 100 cubic feet of water. And if approved today, it will officially go into effect in February. And that is a, a summary of, of the situation and the resolution. I'd be happy to entertain any questions you might have. Hey, Mark, I, I think we talked about this, but the contract that they signed, is this, what, what is the length of the contract that they both signed? The, the limit? Uh, the, length, length. the length, they both have 10 year contracts. 10 year, okay. They were executed back in 2014 and 2015 respectively. They do have automatic rollovers once they reach okay. the end of their 10 year term. Okay. And, and both utilities are very um, pleased with the, the quality uh, of KUB's water supply, that they like that arrangement. Dandridge, when they actually notified us, say we hate to do this, it's just that the economics are somewhat significant. But uh, as you can see, they readily returned even before the rate officially goes, the, the reduced rate officially goes into effect. Any other questions? I'll entertain a motion and second. So moved. Mr. Warden. Second. Uh, Ms. Hamilton. Okay, are there, are there any members of the public who would like to address the board on this resolution? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Coley, will you call the roll? Yes, uh, Commissioner Askew. Aye. Commissioner Hamilton. Aye. Commissioner Herbert. Aye. Commissioner Caballero. Aye. Commissioner Simpson-Brown. Aye. Commissioner Small. Aye. Commissioner Worden. Aye. 
Resolution 1428 has passed on second reading. Very good, thank you. Uh, now it's time for our president's report. Uh, Gabe, would you like to? Yes, yes. Thank you, Chair. Commissioners, Liz Hanna, our manager of executive services and environmental stewardship, is here today to review the annual disclosures uh, process to the board. This is very, very similar to what our employees do every year. And I will I'm pleased to announce that all of our employees have signed their conflict of interest forms, and we have completed that this year. Uh, and she's also going to share some information about the Tennessee Open Meetings Law and Open Records Acts. So thank you, Liz. Good afternoon. Commissioners, as you know, in your role as commissioners on our board, there are several regulations relating to ethics with, with which you comply. Some of those originate with the city charter, some with resolution one adopted by the KUB board, the very first resolution, and others with the present day conflict of interest policy adopted by the board in the year 2000. In 2005, KUB adopted a conflict of interest policy for all KUB employees, and it requires the annual disclosure process that Gabe mentioned a moment ago. In 2006, the state became more involved and established an ethics commission, and subsequently, municipalities across the state adopted ethics policies, as this board did in the year 2007. In 2012, the bylaws section of the KUB, or the KUB bylaws was updated, the ethics section, excuse me. And then in 2013, the annual disclosure process for our commissioners was put in place, and that's what we're touching on today. The conflict of interest policy has several key areas that it addresses and it helps to establish ethical standards for all of our employees as well as our commissioners. It helps to avoid any real or perceived conflicts of interest and the key areas, some of the key areas are nepotism, gifts and gratuities, political activity, improper use of the position or authority and use of KUB time or equipment. If there are any conflicts, they must be disclosed during this annual process. So today in your packets, you have an envelope that includes your annual disclosure form. So we'd ask that you complete that and return it to us by the end of the month. Also today, I have uh, information about the Tennessee Open Meetings Act, which we comply with with our board meetings, as well as the new community advisory panel. As reflected on the slide, the act relates to bodies that make decisions or recommendations to a public body. Obviously our board makes decisions, the new panel is charged with making recommendations to this board, so this applies to them as well. Some of the requirements with which we comply are providing adequate public notice for all meetings, that we record the minutes and make them open to the public, those are posted on our website after meetings, and importantly that all decisions and deliberations toward making decisions are discussed only in open meetings. So we are always diligent to comply with this requirement and of course that any votes be in public as well. Lastly, I have information related to the Tennessee Public Records Act. As you can see on the slide, it applies to all records regardless of their form. So this would be documents and any other records. It could be recordings such as the recording we take of the board meeting and then post that on our website. Any form of record is included in this and there are very few exceptions. For our commissioners, most commonly this would be correspondence back and forth with you, things that you share with us or that we share with you. All of that would be subject to this act and it's any documents or records that are made or received during the course of KEB business. The board adopted our open records policy through resolution 1358 and we comply with that. Some of the provisions include the processes by which people may make these requests to KUB and how we'll respond to those, the naming of a public records coordinator which we have, and making our policy available on the website as it is today. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer those for you. Mr. Coley, would you like to comment on the difference between what we can do in these meetings and what we can do in our luncheons? I would say this, that the luncheon meeting is also a public meeting and uh, it's part of the notification process and uh, as you know when we adjourn the formal meeting, uh, <clears throat> there is an announcement that that meeting is open as well. However, at, as, a, as a practice, 
uh, this board has been careful not to, to um, and the staff has been careful not to present any matters for decision during the lunch meeting. And, uh, and more uh, what you receive typically in the lunch meeting are reports uh, on matters that may later come before the uh, formal meeting. And so uh, while they're both open, um, there is some distinction in practice in what you do. Thank you. Mr. Coley, talk about the new advisory board and its relationship to this board. Um, can we talk to members of the advisory board because it said that it includes both us and them about matters that may come before KUV? You know, in my opinion, the advisory board is um, somewhat in the gray area. However, they are a board that if you look at their function, it is to make recommendations or suggestions to this board. Therefore, it falls under the umbrella of public meeting. And, and so the same rules apply. It would be uh, in violation of, uh, of the Open Meetings Act for members of the panel to get together to discuss matters that concern uh, the, the charge of that committee. And likewise, it would be inappropriate, in my opinion, for informal communications to occur between that panel and board members outside of the official process. Okay. That's, that's what I was concerned about is, you know, can, as, as that's a, they, they are members of the, the public who are in, on the advisory board, but because they are on the advisory board, if we need to interact with them, we need to make sure that it is, for KUB business, that it is within public, the right. public sphere. In that form. In that form, okay. And just to clarify, a group is two people. So yes. we can't, no one of us can meet with another one of us to discuss business. No. Correct. Very good. Correct. Right. Thank you for the clarification. Other questions? Very good. Thank you, Thank you. as always. Commissioners, uh, like to, as you are fully aware, we are very supportive of electric vehicles and have done a lot of things in the last few years to support that endeavor. Uh, this past November, the board adopted new policy guidelines, and among, among other things, a new EV rate is coming from TVA. I'd like to recognize Mike Bolin, Vice President of Utility Advancement, to provide you details of that rate. Thank you, Mr. Bolus. Uh, as you're aware, KUB has been very supportive of the, of the electric vehicle effort over the years. Uh, it's taken the form of an e EV charger rebate that we offer to residential electric service customers. Uh, a rebate of up to $400 for the installation of a Type 2 charger. Um, that's been very popular. It's been going on about 18 months now. Had about 130 uh, rebates we've uh, given out. Uh, we make it widely known, and, and uh, it remains the one and only uh, rebate program in the Tennessee Valley. Uh, most recently, in November 1st, the board adopted and, and we implemented time of use rates uh, that can be used by EV owners to help the economics of electric vehicles. So if you charge your electric vehicle at night off the peak, you get a super low rate as compared to charging on peak. And so it's a supportive type rate structure that helps with uh, uh, people that want to drive an electric vehicle. So we've done that as well. Uh, we've also been participating for several years now in the statewide electric vehicle efforts uh, that ultimately culminated with an organization called Drive Electric Tennessee that we're a corporate member of. And it has TDOTs in it, TDEX in it, uh, TVAs in it. There's, there's a lot of interested parties that came together to, to drive a statewide electric vehicle adoption effort. And we're a part of that. TVA has their own efforts uh, that, that they've done and we have been active in TVAs efforts as well in meetings as TVA tries to figure out how best to enable um, electric vehicles to become more prevalent. Um, for both us and TVA, if you think about it, electric vehicles offer the environmental benefits of being a cleaner source um, as well as, it's a, honestly, it's a growth opportunity for both of us as well, the electrification of transportation. So we're kind of lockstep in that regard. 
Uh, speaking of TVA, as Gabe mentioned just now, the TVA board actually took some action in November um, that would be an, an effort to try to help uh, electric vehicles. The first thing they did was uh, to allow the resale of power at EV chargers. Uh, typically, TVA historically, and even our current contract today, TVA does not allow our customers to resell power to another person. So if you bought power at your house from us, you couldn't resell that power to your neighbor. That's prohibited under all the contracts. So up until this board action, if you were a public EV station, you couldn't sell power at that EV station, even though that's what you were doing. You were selling power to somebody to charge their, their car. So to work around that, uh, the EV chargers, really what they did is they rent time. So you bought time at a charger uh, instead of kilowatt hours. So a little bit of a distinction there, but, but uh, as part of this uh, board action in November, they got away with that. They, they did away with that. The second thing that the TVA board did was they uh, started allowing distributors that wanted to own public EV charging stations to do, so, do that. They haven't set up all the guidelines that they want distributors to follow like us yet, but, but that's in process. So that's the second thing that they did. The third thing they did, is the reason we're here today, is that TVA uh, decided they would provide a, a EV fast charger wholesale rate. And uh, let's talk a little bit about that. As a reminder, and I'm sure, you know, if y'all do other things besides this, so uh, there are three different main types of electric vehicle chargers. The first one, I'll call it a level one, is basically what, if you buy an electric vehicle, that's what you comes with it. It would be a charger that you could put in that wall outlet right over there, plug into your car, and a couple days later, you'd go somewhere. I mean, it's very, very slow charging, but it does charge, and if you don't have any other option, that is kind of an option, and that's what comes with all cars. Uh, you can see, you know, 12 to 14 hours later, uh, you're, you're filled up, and you think about that as, again, a residential type charger. Uh, this, the next type of charger is a level two. A level two is plugged into an outlet that looks like your dryer outlet. Think of it that way. It's a 240 uh, uh, volt outlet that you plug into. And if you actually owned an electric vehicle and you were charging at home, you would likely install one of these in your garage uh, to charge it because your car can charge overnight, be fully charged in a few hours, and then the next day you can go to work. So, or go about your business. So a level two charger, if you actually were an owner, that's probably what you would have. That's what we currently offer a rebate on. If you go to a public parking garage and you see electric chargers there, or you go to a business somewhere out front, you see electric chargers there, those are probably level two chargers, because that's what they are. Uh, a fast charger is the next step up, if you will, in electric vehicle charging. And it charges a vehicle up to 80% to 90% within 30 minutes or so, depending on how powerful that charger is. So it's a significant advancement in the time it takes to charge your vehicle. Not as fast as a gas station uh, and a gas powered car, but it's getting there. Uh, so that, that's a fast charge station. So on, on KUV system, here's two examples of fast chargers that exist on KUV station. Uh, on your left there, that's the fast charge installation at the Walmart uh, on Walmart Drive between Walmart and Sam's. Uh, it's, it's right there in the middle of the parking lot. You can't miss it if you look at it. And you see there's four chargers there, and that's an Electrify America owned uh, charging station. On your right uh, is a Tesla charging station that was just installed right before Christmas. Uh, down uh, Calvin's on the river, that parking area right outside there. It's a temporary station. Tesla is a little bit like Apple. Um, they have their own charging standards, their own charging cords. You know, you, you don't put an Apple phone charger thing in an Android phone, right? Tesla's the same sort of way. So they got their own charging stations. Uh, and that they installed that uh, just on a temporary basis. I think they're planning to remove it in uh, February uh, because of the, um, they wanted to make sure their car owners had more opportunities to charge during the holiday season. So it's been a very, very popular spot. But there are 
fast chargers on the KUB system. So, what's the big deal about fast chargers? Well, it's one thing to own an EV vehicle and charge it and go to work or go to the grocery store and come back home. It's another thing to drive an EV vehicle and drive it to Memphis. Uh, you know, the idea that you're going to have to refill your, your electric tank, if you will, on the way between here and Memphis creates what's called range anxiety. You worry about, you know, am I going to be able to make it? How do I plan my trip? And uh, fast chargers uh, that we've talked about are, are ways that people can take longer trips beyond daily commutes and, and go about their business. So it, it gives people the confidence that owning an EV vehicle really would be equivalent to a gasoline vehicle because they can always get a recharge uh, along the way. So that's what's special about EV fast charging. Uh, but the current rate structure that we have which really is a reflection of what TEA charges us, is not very kind to EV fast chargers. Um, our rate structure, again, parallel on TVAs, actually uh, consists of two, two components. The commodity, the KWH, that's used uh, to charge a vehicle, and also a demand charge, which reflects the peak, the peakiness of the usage. And uh, EV fast charger has very little consumption, but really high demand. So when a car comes along and plugs in, all of a sudden, zzz, 30 minutes, it's, it's done. But that zzz part is a really high peak load on our system, and they are charged a lot for that, okay? Uh, but, but the KWH, not so much. So a recognition by the TVA board uh, was that maybe there's a better way to design rates associated with that. So the TVA uh, board action in November was to adopt a EV fast charger wholesale rate. Uh, this rate would not have a demand charge associated with it. It's purely a consumption or KWH rate. So that significantly lowers the effective rate to EV fast chargers uh, is what that does. And it also makes it easier for the EV fast charger owner to charge for their product. Uh, because there's a direct correlation between what they sell to what they pay to uh, their supplier. As opposed to right now, they got the demand charge in there. They don't have to charge for that. They just got to pay more than what they normally would. Uh, this TBA wholesale rate applies not only to uh, public stations like there at the Walmart, but also to fleet stations like the city of Knoxville is looking to electrify their bus fleet uh, to apply to that type of opportunity, or at some point there may be um, fleets of delivery vehicles that might be electrified. It would apply to those as well. So it's, it's a wide ranging opportunity for people to have a specialized rate for uh, electric vehicle fast chargers. The third item on there, it is a non-standard type rate, uh, non-standard in that Normally, TBA takes all of our meter readings from us at a wholesale meter, at a wholesale meter like down at West Hills, and they accumulate all that up and they send us a bill. In the case of this rate structure, we send TBA the meter readings on that particular customer, and then TBA sends us a bill for that particular customer. It's a, it's a pass-through, flow-through, very non-standard type rate structure that's necessary in order to do this. In order for us uh, collectively you know, to actually offer this, TVA doesn't have customers, EV fast charge customers. We have EV fast charge customers. In order for uh, that uh, offering of TVAs to apply, we have to adopt a parallel rate schedule that flows through that benefit of that fast charge rate to our customers. Uh, we've been working closely with TVA since November to come up with a retail rate structure that matches uh, their wholesale rate and we'll be coming back in February to discuss that and, and ask for your permission to adopt that rate schedule and offer it to our customers. So with that, I'd be happy to answer your questions. Before I open it up to questions, just want to say thank you 
for uh, all, on behalf of all of us non-engineers for introducing the onomatopoeia, the. Uh, <laughs> 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 I think y'all can identify that. <laughs> so, are there questions, Jerry? I, I was gonna ask a question on similar lines, but the zzz, I was going to ask what the scientific term for that was. <laughs> and can you spell it? Yeah. It's like this old fryer and a hot dog deal. No one ever did that with power, but anyway. So, so Mike, I, I, I think you lost me at one point. So you said that the customers will be our customers, but they will TVA will build them as a pass-through to us? Was that, is that how it no, is now or how it will be? A little bit of miscommunication there. Yeah. Uh, we will build the customers. Right. Then we will turn around and submit those, that information and meter readings to TVA on that individual customer and say, here are the meter readings for this individual customer. Then TVA will calculate us a bill for that customer as opposed to the big bill they give us for all of our customers. It's sort of a carved out bill from TVA. So will the will the customer get two different uh, no, the bills? Customer, the customer is our customer. They'll get a bill from us. I'm talking about the, the relationship between us and TVA is a unique relationship on the wholesale side. Good. I guess my question for this is how, how does this scale? If we have a couple of customers right now, it seems to be easier. But moving forward, will that continue to be just a separate way of, of invoicing? Uh, as long as TVA will let us do that, yes, because if we were to try to do it with our normal rates that TVA charges us, it would be a very high rate, the same issue they run into today. So as long as TVA allows us the opportunity to provide this lower rate to our customers, it would be to all of our advantages. My question is more around um, as we grow, like how do we, how do we streamline this so that not, it just seems like a lot of work on both ends to be doing that. So I wonder if today if we have, how, how many stations like this do we have in the city? The, really, the, there's only two. Right. I know, so, but there's not that many in the Tennessee Valley. This is, a, this is an effort by TVA to help proliferate you know, EVs around the system. But the reality is, 80 some odd percent, 88 percent or so of, of EV charging, electric vehicle charging is done at home. Oh. I mean, typically you would always be doing it at home, in your garage, very cheap. You don't go to a fast charger if you didn't have a choice. You, were, you forgot to charge, you live in an apartment, you were out of town, or some other reason. So it's just that 2% of the charge time. The other, the other percent, a lot of people charge at work. Mm -hmm. You know, they charge at home, or they charge at work if it's available. And it's just that small 2%, 3% of the time that you own an electric vehicle, that you're traveling, that you might use one of these. So there so, won't be as many EV fast chargers as there are gas stations okay. out there. That's Even when everybody's driving an EV, there won't be that many. And one more question. Do I understand that um, the Tesla station that was there, that was since that was temporary, Tesla's not going to be a part of this arrangement then for right now because they don't have other charging stations, fast charging stations? Down, Tur down Turkey, Creek, Turkey Creek, there's an existing Tesla charging station right outside the Target. Okay. If, if next time you go down there, you'll notice it's in one of those islands in the parking area there by Target. I would suggest that in the very near future, there may be similar parking arrangements within our service territory. So in that case, since it's to since it's to the owner of those charging stations, we'd have one bill that would go to Tesla, I'm assuming. Yes. Okay. Okay. I, it does sound complicated. It sounds well, pretty labor intensive. Yeah, I, I, probably see, see, emphasize, I probably emphasize the, the uniqueness of the bill too much. We have about 20 customers that are already like that in our system. The University oh. of Tennessee is a separate bill customer that's very uniquely treated. University of Tennessee Hospital. Uh, Tamco, uh, I, I, I'm, there's like 24 of them, or, or a couple dozen of them, they're like that already. This is not going to be materially different than what we're already doing for other customers. I didn't mean to, to complicate the matter here. The good news is having a lower rate that will help right. provide more. Evidence. John, did you have a question? Yeah, just one question, Mike. 
on it with TBA's new rate structure, the fast charge, mm -hmm. somebody rolls in and they're, you know, they're down to 10% or whatever. What would be the cost to get from to fully charge at a fast charge station? What, what, what would be that, that fee? Well, it's, it, and I'm sure they would mark it up, yeah. obviously, but. It, it, yeah, I, I know what the power cost, the power cost component is going to be like 25 cents per KWH. And on a particular KWH, um, gosh, someone's going to have to help me here. Let's say you get 10 miles per KWH or something like that. And Gabe may be a little more aware than I am, obviously, um, because he's a former EV owner. Yeah. So, I know what it costs to charge my car, but not fast charging. So that's a good yeah, question. Yeah, I need to calculate that, John. I know so what is it, like is it $5, $10? I mean, I'm just trying to put it in perspective as what it is math. It, it's all designed to be cheaper than your gas car. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And will be cheaper than your gas car. Even, I, even if you're using a fast charge station. That would be, it would it, be a good number for us to get in yeah. okay. uh, next meeting yes, when we I talk about uh, how... Uh, what would 10 gallons of gas, you know, yeah. you know what, what would it cost for gas in a standard car to go 300 miles sure. versus what it would cost electric to go 300 yeah. miles? That, that would give I us a that comparison, that. I think. Yeah. Mark, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, I was just going to comment on it. It sounded technical, but it's not. We've been doing this a long okay. time. Okay. Very good. It's very smooth. Sure. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Commissioners, we have been, as you know, been doing a lot of research in the municipal, municipal broadband area, and I've been asked Jamie Davis, our vice president and assistant to the CTO, to come give you an update on the steps to do submissions if we proceed with municipal broadband. So, Jamie. Commissioners, good to see you today. Uh, excited to talk to you a little bit little more about our research that we've been doing. And as Mr. Bolas said today, we're going to talk a little bit about the business cases that municipals put together if they decide to move forward in this business and what's inside of those. So these business cases really contain the details about the viability of a, a, and justification for an entity moving forward into this business. Uh, they're what we would submit to our regulatory authorities and as you can see on the screen that's TVA and the State of Tennessee Comptroller. And both of those formats are a little different but yet they really contain at the core the same information inside of each of those. And from our perspective, it really is those four areas of focus that you see on the screen there. And so today we'll talk a little bit about them from kind of an academic perspective of what's inside of those sections, as well as as we continued our research, give you a little bit of insight about some of our thoughts as it relates to KUB. So first, in all cases, the relationship that exists that allows municipals to step into this business is the existence of an electric division. That's really codified per state law. And it's those electric infrastructure assets that many utilities have seen benefits from grid modernization that have allowed them to position themselves to do broadband. And we've talked about that a lot. We've been in this business a little bit too, even though we've not been doing broadband. We have about 150 miles of fiber and we're already seeing the benefits of that fiber on our systems. But as we look across our research and see is in those business cases, there has to be a justification there of why the electric division has invested in that and it starts to describe that very close relationship with the fiber division. Because again, being positioned to do broadband, that set alone separate fiber division would have that relationship with electric and thus that. So the good news is, whereas a lot of the folks that have gone into this area, they were just an electric company and didn't have that relationship of understanding what it was like to have a couple divisions. Well, we've been doing that for quite a bit of time now. We've got our four divisions, separate sets of books in each, each operate separately yet a lot of things are co-shared. So we've got a lot of good experience in that regard. So I think that puts us a little bit ahead in that area. But that's one section and area of focus of the business plan. From there, the other sections really focus on, I would call it the broadband or fiber division entity itself. And as you can imagine, one of the things that you really want to consider and the state wants to understand at a deeper level is if you want to be in this business, can you exist? Can you be competitive? And so one of those sections indeed is an analysis on the competition. And as you might expect, again, if anybody's ever launched a new business or, or jumped into an arena of competition, you want to understand who you're competing against, who are the providers in your service area, how much market share do they have, and how well ultimately could you be in penetrating into that new market. That really is where you come up with an estimate of what customer demand would be there for your product. Would customers move to you as a provider of that? 
one of the key ways to gauge that inside of a business case as it relates to broadband, and I guess any other product, is a purchase intent survey. Um, and that survey is the one we did, as you may recall, last year, um, where we asked on a random basis 400 of our residential customers what they thought about their current service provider and what they thought about KEB. So a little bit of insight into the competition at a little bit deeper level, of course, again, inside of our service territory, we have about six main providers of broadband service. We probably all know who the names of who they are. Many of us probably currently subscribe to them, but as you imagine, Comcast, Xfinity, and AT&T are the largest incumbent providers in that service territory. But one key thing we continue to hear throughout that survey and was we continue to do research not only inside of KUB, but what our peers have, in, have experienced in their area, customers desire choice. And what we found out through the survey is over 60% of the folks inside our service territory have only one choice of service provider. So when we asked them, would you be interested in KUB getting into this business, nearly 80% of the respondees said yes, we would like for KUB to consider getting into this business. And that's again, as we've talked about before, with no knowledge of whatever products we would offer or whatever price that would be at. So you can see that that really kind of gives us some insight into that folks do desire choice. And then another question we'd ask them, would you consider switching to KEB if we offered those same products at a very similar price? And you can see that half of the respondents to that survey said yes, they would consider switching to KEB. So again, as you're putting that fiber plan together and assessing the competition, that gives you a little bit of sense of inertia as to why folks might switch, not only with us, but with other municipal providers. And what I want to also show you too is one of the things that we think that is another reason why folks switch is really the product that's ultimately offered. These are just two representative packages from two providers, both Xfinity in our area, as well as Chattanooga Electric Power Board, municipal provider that everybody's aware of. Um, again, two, two packages from each provider. We'll focus in on the 300 megabyte package and fo focus first on speed. You'll notice again, what's offered in our area even today, 300 megabytes, this is, this is my package, this is what I buy. Um, and you'll see that that's, that's a really solid download speed, very, very fast, very efficient in that regard. But you'll notice the upload speed, again, is not equal to that download speed. Well, why does that matter nowadays? Well, historically it hadn't, but now we're all uploading things to the cloud, we're pushing things that way. Uh, I've been on Zoom calls where my image froze or that circle of death where my video didn't go back up to the internet as fast as I needed it to. It's just things that we're using in society today are different than they were a few years ago. Um, used to a terabyte, you think, well, what's a terabyte? I don't even know what that looks like. Well, and nowadays you, you very well may burn right through that. I use the Bolas family as an example with you know, professionals at home, you know, kids doing school, and maybe a little Netflix and Xbox going on, and you'll, you'll burn through that terabyte real quick. If you go over that, there's a fee for that. Just like for those of us that remember minutes on our cell phone, we used to go over those and they'd charge us for that. Well, that's the same way with data with most providers. Now you can go unlimited, but it's gonna be about 30 more dollars a month. So there's a cost to that too. So if you look at the, the municipal model, and again, I think EPB is pretty representative of what's in the municipal space. Speeds may be different, pricing may be different, but there's some real key distinctions. That fiber to home really allows for unlimited speed and capacity, and you'll see that in their product offering. That again, on their starter package is a 300 megabyte plan. It's symmetrical, meaning both the download speed and the upload speeds are equal. So already you can see is, you know, this very well may be better than that due to the symmetry there. And then I use the adage of use all you want, they'll make more, it's unlimited. They don't charge you for those overages, they don't, you don't have to think about how much you're using. Now again, gigabytes offered here in Knoxville, gigabyte in Chattanooga. I know it's available in Chattanooga, I think Xfinity in some cases has to check and see if it's available in your neck of the woods. Again, why is that? Fiber really is unlimited in many, many cases. I have submit that municipal broadband provides a superior product at a good value. And when we look at that value, current pricing here in Knoxville for this package is $86 and you can see what the cost for Chattanooga EPB is. I think that that quality of the product and a good value is the reason Chattanooga has about 70% market share in the Chattanooga area. So again, present that, you know, again, it, it's just the notion of a superior product at the best value. I won't even say the cheapest because there are other providers who have a market niche that say I want to be the cheapest. So in this case, I think municipal is more about good value in that regard. So our other observations would be just kind of the, the you know, conclusion in the competition realm is utilities do seem to be able to compete in this realm. 
While most don't have necessarily Chattanooga's market share of 70%, a lot of our peers that we talk to that are already in this space somewhere around the 40 to 50% of market share range. So again, very competitive in that regard um, in, in most cases. What we see when a new entrant comes into market, especially in the municipal space, is the competition responds by lowering their prices and trying to get folks under contract. I've always wanted to get those introductory rates over a long haul, right? You know, and so I think that's what a lot of the incumbents will do, is they'll try to get as many folks under, con under contract to maintain their market share as long as they can. The good news for consumers is, in whatever areas these go into, is competition drives good choice, good prices, better products, and so ultimately communities win when there is choice. So that's competition. Next section, the fiber division itself. There's a deep dive, as you might imagine, into everything about that particular entity. It would cover the products that would be sold, the pricing for those products, uh, ultimately what estimated take rate you think that you would obtain as a new entrant to market to project the revenues of that particular division. As you'll see on the screen, most plans that we've researched target a 35% take rate. Well, why? It's a nice balance between it makes the entity viable and worthwhile to go into business. At the same point in time, it's very conservative and not saying that you're, you're having to raise so much revenue or get so much market share to make this a viable entity. So that's, that's what we've seen there. It includes costs for both product of content, uh, you know, the television programming that you very well may provide, along with your capacity to get to the internet and provide that as a service. And then I talked about that relationship with the electric division. In this financial plan, it also goes ahead and says, this is, this needs, you need to budget for those fees to pay back the electric division for its fair share of the use of the fiber division. So that's included in the fiber funding plan in that regard as well. And that's something we're not used to, but we're starting to learn more and more about is again, you are in a competitive environment. You will have to compete against folks that are in this business. And so you need to have some budget and plan for marketing and sales as well. So that's the fiber plan component. And then lastly, the funding plan. How do you get into this business? How do you, how do you create the capital to, uh, to purchase large assets in this regard? And so what is presented in the business plan are uh, funding plans for both that electric division and the fiber divisions. It's a complete set of pro forma financials for 10 years and looking at the budget, ultimate cost expenses and puts and takes and where you end up in a, in a, in a financial position throughout that time period. It goes ahead and establishes those financial relationships between cost sharing, how we would split shared costs just like we do today again amongst our four divisions. It would establish that along with that repay rate or that lease rate, access rate fee that uh, the fiber division would pay electric. And then at the end of the day, much like all what we have seen through all plans is that when you have to generate a large capital for infrastructure projects, you, re you generate those funds through the traditional means that utilities have in front of them, which is through rates and debt in that regard. And we would think that as we developed our plans, it would be in a balanced manner, just like we have done with all of our other uh, KEB infrastructure programs. So those are the four main sections as we move into consideration of, of them, what's next? So once those business plans are complete, we would come back to this board and say, can president and CEO submit those for consideration to TVA and to the state of Tennessee comptroller? That is not a final decision about getting into the business. All that is, is can those bodies take a look at the plans and say, are they complete? And are they approved to move forward to the next step? We think that process, once we submit those plans to those bodies, they tell us it would take about 60 to 90 days for review is usually what they take to do that. And then once that is achieved, then we can move forward to those next steps uh, in the process that we've talked about in times past. So next steps, where does that lead us? Is we're, we're continuing our stakeholder discussions. Uh, in December, I think we were here uh, talking about, or November actually, uh, talking about uh, you know, what were next steps. Obviously, we're continuing our dialogue with you all. We've started talking to some community stakeholders, and I'm pleased to report that those are going very well. We've talked to both our mayors, and they're very supportive of the notion and concepts and want to hear more. Um, we began to talk to other stakeholders, and so that, that continues to go well. It was teased at our customer advisory panel last month about this would be a topic for discussion. Uh, and up, or not said last month, this month, earlier this month, uh, as far as a topic for discussion, and there was enough interest in that they wanted to move that up on the schedule. So we'll be talking to them in February. And because of that interest and, and the, the progress we're making in our research, as far as the timeline goes, we think we may be back as early as March to you all for consideration of submission of those business plans. And again, I want to reiterate, that's not a final decision. That would just be allowing us to move forward with a review of those business plans. So more to come, 
Uh, but, but again, research is, is coming forward, good information, a lot of positive momentum here, um, but would love to, to entertain what questions you may have. Okay. Hey. So Jamie, I don't, I don't have a question per se, but I do have a, uh, an observation and comment. As we talk about this, particularly as we talk about need and support and community, it's important that we, I don't know where we are with this idea of the fund to support low income communities, I think, as we, we talk about this, um, particularly as people see a utility, it's, they, they think, hey, it's, you're all about getting money and, and, and things like that. But I think it's important to also build into our communications that we have a process in which to support people who might not have access because Absolutely. the digital d divide is real yes. in many communities. And so um, some people will say, this, this sounds good for everybody else, but how, you know, but we can't yes. afford, we can't pay for it. So we have to make sure that we communicate that is built into the plan. Yeah, I, I can't echo that enough too. What we have heard even in talking to folks, I'll say outside the fence and even our peers are in this business, you know, consistent themes that broadband's become a utility. It's almost become a way of life. And I think that then highlights and exacerbates that digital divide. And then we keep in close contact and have been working along this path with, with Electric Power Board of Chattanooga. They've just launched that Ed Connect plan. It's going really well. They've got about 9,000 kids already signed up about 5,000 households, um, so it's going well. What's interesting is, is that, you know, to, to my knowledge, very few are doing that, so even EPB is being a trailblazer in that particular area, and so I think it may take us some time, but I think we ought to keep our eye on that ball, that aspirationally, we want to do something like that too if we get in this business, absolutely. Other questions or comments? I have a question. Um, what percentage of KUB population is eligible or is everyone going to be eligible for um, broadband? Okay, great question. Um, only our electric service territory. So a key distinction, an easy area for us to understand is we have some deep west, which uh, is our KUB gas only customers. And per state law, we can't go outside of our electric service territory. So you would still have large portion of Knox County, all of Knox City, and then parts of those seven surrounding counties where we serve electricity. Great question. John? Just to follow up on that, if, if, could there be an agreement with those uh, utilities that have that jurisdiction to make that available and to, you know, rebrand it, uh, rebrand our, uh, our right. fiber for their system? We would love to make all of our KB customers happy. What I know is this, factually, years ago, a rel similar relationship with EPB in Chattanooga and Cleveland existed, that was stopped. And, in the, and I'll call the hard fence of your electric service territory really was enforced. Nobody's challenged it since then. But what I also know is that the interest continues to grow and under, you know, whether it be our partners at LCUB or other utilities, I think they're asking very similar questions as us. And so whether it's they get into the business or consider something like that, they've done, a, they've done an intent survey a little while back as well. I would hope that as time goes on, we wouldn't leave other, you know, to use the term another desert if you will for people who want municipal broadband that can't get it and so with the I, there are many discussions about could the legislation change in the future but i don't know what that forecast looks like but also, as it stands now the, the, the long answer is we can only do our electric service territory now um also help me with our timeline and our decision making process I just want to make sure obviously this is a this is a huge mm -hmm. decision there are lots of moving components there's right. a lot of information um are we going to workshop this at some point or is this we're going to be meeting individually with you and other folks i think i think yes yes and yes okay i think there are a lot of decisions to happen i think that there are even codified um you know processes inside of the state law that says we have to engage our customers in a formal manner where they would come and talk to talk okay. to this board there's a lot to so go. there's there's a lot there's a lot of steps there so i think that i think the the headline from today as far as moving ahead in that process good momentum good support and again those plans are coming together it says you know well maybe this could be viable why don't we have somebody look at those business plans our regulatory authorities and say is this is this an option for keb so taking that next step that we talked about earlier but again, plenty of opportunity and discussion before then, and we have, we have obviously uh, discussions that will be held with each of you, and it both both you know individually and in public uh, forum here about our plans in that regard. Celeste, did you have a question? Yeah, Bill, have you looked at the statute, and do you know anything about its legislative history? And if I, I would be interested to to get a citation to the statute and 
and and sort of try to understand the mm -hmm. the thought process you know behind the law in the event that there's an opportunity to tweak that Spain. law okay i say the prohibition on electric service territory was put into place almost as a concession to the existing providers Other questions or comments? Well, one last question, Jamie. I know we've engaged uh, some outside groups, uh, consulting groups on, on surveys, our, our mm -hmm. current customers and all that. Have we engaged? Obviously, there are a lot of utilities throughout the country that are making this leap. Uh, do we have any, are we planning on engaging any outside consultants to give us reports on you know the market viability and the competition and all that i mean as a board member i would want to you know things that often look like a no-brainer right uh you know you want an outside third party to say okay we've reviewed this and we right. that's why we have outside auditors on our financials um to say here here are your uh blind spots here are your here are your target areas and this is what you need to look out right. for is that yeah. is that in the plans? I don't, works know, that, at all? I don't know that there. Are, I, I would love to find somebody to look at an overarching concept. What I do know is there are specific technical questions, both from the technical arena, kind of engineering and infrastructure, as as well as the marketplace and other other risk in that regard. That we either have completed engagements or we've got engagements lined up to ask those very questions. So, nothing necessarily that somebody would step in and say yes this is good because even the state of Tennessee won't do that with the control they just say this looks this looks well-rounded I think that um, it would be worthy for anybody that wants to look at it and help us look at it to kick the tires on that and again um, I can't state enough how much you know electric power board Chattanooga being a trailblazer in this regard kind of knows where those pitfalls are and everything else so they've been a real great guide up until this point and we'll, we continue to lean on them for guidance but um, I, we continue to look for industry expertise to tell us what has happened in the past and what may happen in the future. So absolutely, We're, we, we are actively looking for those type of opportunities. Great Just question. a couple, uh, back on your uh, screen with the, uh, the slide with the uh, comparative rates. Yes. Could we, just for the sake of uh, being consistent, uh, the Xfinity rates were Knoxville rates and the Chattanooga rates were Chattanooga rates. Would it be possible actually, to get the Chattanooga Xfinity the, just so we're apples and apples? Yeah, I actually was surprised. We actually pulled that in advance of this meeting, assuming that they would be lower in Chattanooga and they're the exact same. Oh, okay, good. Well, then let's yeah. put Knoxville on them then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Chair, we don't have a fiber race. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, I think that, and again, Xfinity's packages change readily. Um, I think this is going up to 400 for this $86 right okay. now. So it's it like, changes, it, it's like nail and jello yeah. of the wall sometimes with those packages to understand. So yeah. just, just really. I just don't want to get, give anybody a book also. to shoot us with. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and, I'm with you. and I would also, I, I uh, commend John for his questions because in my experience, the only things that are no brainers appear so only to people with no brains. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I want uh, a couple of our members, uh, I, I guess the two things that I would observe about this uh, based on our former conversations uh, here in these meetings is the two primary drivers are the improved uh, functionality of our power system That's right. that this would allow and two, the ability to provide broadband to places where uh, the for-profits are not willing to to provide it. Absolutely. Is that a fair summary? Okay. Uh, just want to make sure we're all on the same page because I think some of us are, 
we're, this is one of those things where we're going to be in our brain and in our heart. That's right. And, uh, and the, the heart part of it, I think, is so that the digital divide that exists and is being exacerbated because of COVID, uh, yeah, we may be able to be a part of the solution. Yeah, I would submit to you that the reason municipals are getting into this, and we can talk at length about this, it's a win-win-win proposal. Right. It really is the, the benefits of reaching those underserved. It's running our utility in a different way and positioning us for the future of things that applications that we don't know exist. Right. And fiber really is that is that almost, you know, agnostic of what comes at our way. Fiber is going to be a great role and a great, great investment for Knoxville. Thank you. Thank you all. We really appreciate your expertise. Uh, Gabe? So I wanted to do a presentation on the, uh, as you all know, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, we had a uh, light snow, actually a heavy snow. And I want to give you an update on that because it was significant. It's significant to our employees, significant to our customers, and it's something that was um, very important to us. Let me take this mask off to make it a little better to read. Uh, a little bit, I just, I'm, a, I'm a nerd, you know, by nature. So some of the statistics about Christmas Day snows, uh, some of my folks looked up. Since 1871, there have only been 13 snows on Christmas in the history of Knoxville. And this one ranked number two in history. So we don't get snow very often on Christmas. And we like the looks of it, but it was very troubling for our system. And so um, if you were around in 1969, that was the largest snow in Knoxville history on Christmas Day, 1969. So here was the forecast. Um, if you look at the date and time on this chart, it was at 3 o'clock on Christmas Eve, literally when the snow started at 3 o'clock that afternoon. We were projected to get one, two inches. And we've been, we knew about this days in advance and prepared uh, our folks to be working that time uh, in case something happened. And so we were, we were fully vetted. And in fact, we had released a crew to go work in Sevier County that day because we thought we'd get one to two inches and it'd be a non-event. And they went down there and worked. And then, of course, as you know, it ended up being three to seven inches of snow in Knoxville. Uh, we called that crew back and then brought all of our forces on board immediately and created our actual IC, our ICS program, kicked into full gear that evening on Christmas Eve to start restoring power. Uh, we adjusted quickly. Folks came in very quickly, you know, knowing it's a holiday and it's a big deal for a lot of families, our folks made an effort to come in as quickly as best they could given the conditions that were out there to start working. As you also remember, it got really cold that night. We now had temperatures in the teens, uh, almost down to 10 degrees that night. So it was a very challenging surprise storm, if you want to call it. While it was beautiful to look at, it was uh, wreaked havoc on our system. And so we, did, we adjusted very quickly. At the peak, we had about 23,000 customers out at one point that evening on Christmas Eve. Uh, we began, as you can see the dots on the screen over there, with a lot of folks everywhere. I know, you know, it wasn't just the one concentrated area of Knoxville. Even though the central part's heavy, it went Union County, East Knoxville, South Knoxville, West Knoxville, uh, all, the, all in between. And so we had a lot of folks working as fast as they could, as uh, safely as they could in those areas. Overall, 32,000 customers were affected by the storm at some point over the four-day weekend of restoration. Uh, so we had folks that were out for you know, hours to days in some cases. 90% of the outages were trees, um, as was expected. The heavy snow, it was really, really, it had some winds on top of that. Uh, these are just a handful of the pictures. So some of the cases, it was just hard to get to the lines that were down. We had to clear trees, Knox County, City of Knoxville, other communities. Uh, I mean, uh, municipalities helped us get to those things. Uh, but as you can see, half of the trees were outside our trim zone, as a, as a lot of the pictures show, way outside of where we would normally trim. And then another 40% were inside our trim zone. It just like that, once again, the weight of the snow, the weight of the ice, the wind on top of that, the heavy rain we've been having all year, the soft ground, uh, just wreaked havoc on the system. And so very challenging. It, it broke a lot of wires. It, it did a d damage to our poles and transformers. And, we made our best efforts to get to those sites as we could. Um, you know, it would have been bad enough if it had just been snow and ice, but we also had COVID. You know, we have crews that are being quarantined, folks that are out, obviously, because of, of what's going on. So, you know, as we called other systems for help, they only can offer us so many folks themselves. I mean, it was just a challenging 2020 finale uh, for, this, for, this, uh, for our system. As you can see, 61 KEB. Crews were involved at some point in this event, uh, both uh, our contractor and, and our, our KB folks. We actually were able to get 25 off-system crews. These are folks from outside the Knoxville area. Like, I'll give you a, 
a list of those folks in a minute. They came from different states in some cases to help us out. Um, but it was challenging to get around. I mean, we, we struggled to get to some of these locations for a while uh, and made every effort as we could. What you'll notice on the chart on the right, the red is new events. And the blue was closed events, the, the bar charts. And as you see, what's is unusual about this event, so the first night we had a lot of new outages, but every day new ones kept occurring as it thawed out, as the, as the tree finished giving out because of the weight on it. We kept getting new events every day. So it wasn't, we never really could, every time we got one done, another one would pop up somewhere else. And so it was really challenging for our folks just to keep moving and knowing that, you know, that it, wow, it was just, um, important that we kept, you know, kept on the goal. So even as Christmas Day, Christmas Day after, day after that, there was a lot of red popping up there, even though it didn't snow anymore. Uh, and we did have all our customers restored in four days after it was all said and done. So that Monday the 27th, uh, we were fully restored for those, or 20, I'm sorry, the 28th, we were fully restored uh, for, for those folks that saw it, like I said, depending on where you were at, you saw it at different times. And, and the, uh, the event was really challenging. These are just some pictures we took. We got a bunch more, but you know, this is a truck that was trying to miss a car. It was going very slow, but the ice, the road was just solid sheet ice and just slid slowly off in the ditch. You know, those are things that just, you know, you, ch you can change on your trucks, you can do all the things you want, but ice just ultimately wins. Uh, there we are working in the snow in the middle. That's the snow falling as they're trying to climb poles. And then I thought that picture to the right was just beautiful, you know, the sun in the background, mm -hmm. what little sun we had that weekend. And, the crews climbing and doing their stuff to restore power as we went along. And so they worked nonstop. You know, we, we never slowed down for this event ever. What you didn't probably hear about, so we had other things going on in the system. Uh, we had water main breaks. It got really cold. And so I had, we had crews working on water main. 105 events occurred over those four days of, you know, typical when it gets down to teens, uh, mains break, houses have issues. And so our folks in the under eye construction were working just as hard in a very cold water, wet ditch, uh, trying to restore water as they could. Um, and to the north of us, our friends at Hallsdale Powell had issues making enough water. Their plants were having an issue with the cold events and, their, and the main breaks. So they actually asked us to open up valves and pump water their direction for four days. And so it was a challenge behind the scenes just to keep water supplied to our folks and to the other communities around us. And so our folks, once again, over a holiday weekend, never missed a beat. I, I can't say enough thank yous to our folks and to our friends that helped us in this event. As I mentioned before, 61 crews, 300 employees when it's all said and done worked Christmas Eve, Christmas Day, the days after Christmas to help restore power. Uh, the 25 crews that we got, as you see, North Carolina, West Tennessee, Alabama, uh, came to our support and helped us through this event. They were very gracious in that. I actually sent personal letters to each of those folks. I got a response back from Wilson County Electric that said, Not, we owed you a favor. You helped us in a gas situation years ago, and we were going to turn the favor, so we were glad to come help you do an electric event. And so these partnerships are critical. Relationships we have with our friends and peers and, and neighbors are very critical. So, um, you know, they, they stepped up, and as you see in the picture and right, it was difficult. That's two guys climbing a single pole and then three other guys holding that pole still mm. uh, because, you know, you just don't want to, you just don't know what you don't know. And so, it, you couldn't get trucks with these poles in a lot of cases. You had to climb them. Uh, and so they worked there uh, in these crazy cold conditions and, and restored power to our folks. And so, um, you know, it's extremely, uh, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Uh, we got a lot of responses, uh, more positive than I ever expected. People really appreciate our folks sacrificing their time with their families to get out there and do this. They know it's part of what we sign up for, but still that's a sacrifice they're making to, to restore power and, and in cases water our customers and these are just a sample of the ones we, we got from customers of, of saying thank you we saw you we appreciate what you did pass it on to the folks that did the work and, 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 and thank them for what they did and once again another picture of just wow it's pretty to look at from the if you look at the trucks the snow on the trees it, it, it was all it was just treacherous for us to work in uh, and our folks like I said did a just a bang-up job of making it and doing the best they could as much as they could and so I wanted to say personally thank you to all our employees that stepped up and did that. Uh, you know, we couldn't do it without them. Like I said, as I said earlier, that's part of what they signed up for, but we don't expect them to work every holiday and every event that comes up all the time. But they did, and they came in and with a smile on their face and were tired when it was all said and done. Uh, and we want to I want to say thank you to those folks that worked it. And if I take any questions, comments from the board, uh, but I wanted to make you all aware of that and how big a deal it was to us. Hey, what is the, the comparison of this storm with 
other outage events, just to kind of put it in perspective? Um, when we looked at it, I want to correct me if I'm wrong, John, it's our eighth largest event in history. So it was pretty big, mm -hmm. eighth largest. Um, unfortunately, about top of uh, those top eight, about six of them have occurred in the last decade, it feels like. <laughs> and so um, that's just part of it. Yeah. But it was, a, it was a pretty large. I mean, we were, I remember sending my son a text at 3.15 on that Christmas Eve saying, oh, look at the pretty snow. It's coming <laughs> down. And then it just kept coming. I mean, it never stopped. And so um, it turned into that. So, you know, for me, it wasn't as pretty. <laughs> it was all said that. John. <laughs> yes. Having served on this board, I've gotten to where I, when I see snow events like this, <laughs> I start to get a little, started, my kids are playing in the front yard, and I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> uh, but question for you, how is, I noticed that 51% of our outages were caused mm -hmm. by trees outside the yep. trim zone. How is the trim zone determined? It's by the... The, the type of, actually, next, for instance, 13 kV, which is our standard distribution, we trim X feet around that. As you get to higher voltage, you go further. You know, so your transmission lines that we have, it's a, larger, it's, it's a larger diameter of trim zone. So it's determined by the voltage of the system, the importance and voltage of the system. But is that set by state law? How no, is that? How it's, is actually that a, it's actually a safety practice, it's a standard safety practice that we all have. All utilities follow some of the similar guidelines um, as far as a safety zone. Um, you know, also it's a balance of you want to cut more than the customer wants you to cut. So it's a balance of That's customer right. need and safety for our employees and our system. So for instance, a, you know, a typical distribution line down a subdivision would be 10 feet on each side, but a big line that serves towards a substation would be 25 feet on each side because it's a much more critical line, a much more higher voltage line. And that's just round numbers where there's other locations where it's bigger or smaller. Uh, but if we wanted to than, change any aspect of that trimming, yep. that, that is mostly our own policy so yes. if, like if we did normal trim in the normal zone and we said you know what we're going to scan for dead trees yep. beyond that another 10 feet if we, wanted to, we have that capability it's not set in any kind of that's federal correct. or state that's well, correct okay thank and you. i will say that's a great i'm glad you asked that question because it reminded me of something i didn't say what, what we did different in this event that we hadn't done maybe as much in previous events is once it was over we actually sent crews out to look for dead trees you know, it's one of those things now the time they're getting good. So we went out and actually surveyed these circuits and said, what's dead that's maybe out of our trim zone that the customer may want us to remove it or we may want to take it out ourselves. And we found 100, 200 trees that we went ahead and just worked with the customer to get removed so we can, in essence, prevent the next outage in that area. So great question, John. I appreciate you asking that. And the, if I recall correctly, the, uh, the width of the zones, we negotiated that with the tree board that was part of the tree board recommendations. Yeah. We, so we want to make sure we follow those recommendations. A, it was a community political yes. uh, deal. Yeah, you um, never, yeah, and so. and it's, a, it's a balance. And, you know, yeah. the, the, for me, and I will just my anecdotally say, for some customers want us to trim more. Oh, yeah. You know, why don't you take that tree in my backyard out while you're at it kind of thing? <laughs> you know, as opposed to, you know, so you get, you know, but we, we try to work with every customer's request, good or bad, and, and look at the situation. Uh, we've done a lot to improve our tree trimming over the last decade, and I think, we get very, very few complaints, mostly about can you do more. Uh, and so we are looking at those, but d dead trees and things that are, I call them higher hazards, we're trying to remove earlier and faster as we get along. So once again, it's an interesting time. I mean, that was interesting work to be done given the situation. But. So Gabe, two things. First of all, I was gonna ask the same question from, uh, that John asked about the tree trimming policy, and I'm glad that we have taken some look at that. The other thing I would do is just tell the you know, the employees at KUB, those folks who are out there, um, that the board, on behalf of the board, and myself particularly, that thank you. Oh, um, they yeah. did um, a yeoman's task in making sure that power was restored and that um, folks were able to, you know, you know, because for some people, you know, having access to electricity um, is life or death, and so thank them for, for all that they've done. Um, and then the last thing I'll say is, you know, po either pre or post, let's, you know, I think it may create some opportunity for us to communicate again um, uh, how our processes work. Yep. Um, because I was also monitoring, you know, feedback, and I think you know, people always say, "Well, you, you, you're going out to West Knoxville first, and and I think there's a process, but you know, there because is. of um, um, uh, load on certain so hospitals and things like that, we'll, yep. we'll get to first. And so just to help folks understand yep. how we how we do that, so that it's you know we can give them as much information as possible not necessarily to, to try to change their mind, but let them know right. this is how, how KUB works and that we, we do it 
you know, based on the system that is equitable and that, you know, really needs to, yeah. for those that really need to get back on, we do for ourselves. Uh, that might I, be helpful. I will, yes, Tavia, thank you. First of all, I will let them know, I'll let our folks know from the board and from senior staff and executive staff that we appreciate them. I will make sure that gets passed on to those folks uh, first. And you're right, there is a very detailed process of how we restore power. You're right, we need to educate and make people aware of that. It's not a bad thing to remind folks that we do things on a priority basis, but it's not where you live. It's priorities on size, hospitals and daycare. I mean, if facilities like that go first, but there is a priority uh, of, of how we do that, and it is um, somewhat laid out, and we'll, we'll make sure we get that out there. We'll do that. And Claudia, we've discussed this several times but uh, as a board, but if anybody asks you, in its simplistic terms, which is what I'm capable of, it's you start with the hospitals and places like that, the critical places, and then you go to, we're gonna hit, the next thing we're gonna do is, repl is repair that part of the line that affects the most people. Yeah, it's all about and the And then numbers. it goes, I've, it lived on the, I've lived on the end of one of the little short lines <laughs> <laughs> in West Knoxville. <laughs> and you know, it's, it really doesn't have anything to do with geography. It has to do with how many customers can be positively impacted. Yeah, our uh, system does that. I, I, I want to echo what um, Tyve just said. Mm -hmm. I actually had uh, one of my staff members who um, called me, she texted me and she had been out of power for maybe three, four days mm -hmm. at that point. And um, I kind of walked her through what we're just talking about. Okay. And so, cause she didn't understand why, because she said, well, I saw a truck. She, I guess she lives on an end of wherever she lives in Seymour. Mm -hmm. And um, her, her part of her family lives on one end of the street and their power was on, but theirs, uh, and they were on the other end. I said, I guarantee you there's an issue, mm -hmm. and they're working on it. Yeah. So, so I can't tell you exactly what it is, right. but I'm sure that you, it's going to be on, you know, yeah. pretty quickly. And sure enough, it was. Yeah. But, but just to help, you know, um, folks understand that would be helpful. Um, I actually sent her the, I guess, the announcement or whatever the... Um, the public um, exp what, what press release, yeah. I actually sent that to her just to say, yeah. hey, this is what, you may not have seen this, right. well, help you understand. You. She appreciated, she knew everybody was working hard, but yeah. she was getting a little worried. So. Yeah, and, and rightly so. I mean, I, I, and, and we do get those calls about, I saw a KUV truck drive by, sometimes that's our damage assessors assessing how bad it mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. and, and all that. So, we, you know, why didn't they stop here and fix this? And, I, and so we try to, to educate and, and help our folks and let them know where we're at in the situation. But yeah, I appreciate that. We'll do a better job and get that out there and, and get it to where people see it. It's, you know, we may have it out there, but if people aren't reading it, you know, it's, yeah. a, it's, it's another yeah. challenge in itself. So appreciate the feedback. We I'm actually have advice. a video on our restoration process and we try to put it up on social media when we know there's weather coming and we would be happy to send that out to you all if you're interested. Good. Yeah. Good. I've actually seen it on, um, I'm on, I have an iNeighbors app and a lot of KUB stuff comes up on that Our Neighbors app of information. So that's where I've seen it in, mm -hmm. on, that, on that particular app. That's great. So, um, you know, sometimes when these news stations are struggling for content, mm -hmm. that would be a good thing to go to them because some of these stories that they you know, <laughs> will spend five minutes on about, you know, someone's rabbit that did something. Um, <laughs> Very exactly. Well, Adrian. I just, I, I think Adrian, I hope you took I hope you took full credit for KUV's quick response after that woman made a call. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, that happens too. Yeah. All right. Um, I, I'm wondering if um, the, I don't know how many people have signed up for the new app. I love it. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering if that's not a place where messages could be sent more regularly, and that would also give people the incentive to actually download the app and use it more often because yeah. that's where they're going to get the quickest update. Yes, we the app is brand new as you saw last month. We we're just now rolling it out. We are going to put tools like that as far as pushing messages out. We're still learning and figuring mm -hmm. it out. But yes, that's thank you for saying that. Yes, that's that's an opportunity for us to keep pushing that message out. Other questions or comments? Are there any members of the public who wish to address the board today? Seeing none, uh, following adjournment of this meeting, the board will have a lunch session that is open to the public to observe. This meeting is now adjourned.